Okay, uh, this is going to be a show of a compilation of photographs, still photographs I shot out at the Reading World War II weekend over a number of years, approximately 10 years. And interspersed in here is going to be a few shots of planes that came to Marstown. Uh, this is one of them. Betty Jane is owned by the Collins Foundation up in Massachusetts. This is a twin seat P-51, and it says on their website that only five of these were built during World <coughs> War II for training. And of course, it's got a Merlin engine in it. <coughs> Some of the stuff that uh, I mentioned about reenactors and displays, here's a 20th Air Force sign, which would be the Pacific, with the uh, bombs away LeMay, and there's a movie camera of the day, turret lens, Signal core people might be interested in this. We'll see more of this later. And of course, there's Fifi, which you saw in video prior to this. This uh, used to be called the Confederate Air Force. Now it's uh, politically correct. It's the Commemorative Air Force. The plane is based uh, sort of between Dallas and Fort Worth, Arlington maybe. And it used to be based out of Midland, Texas. It got relocated to where it is now because they needed new engines. And some Texan says, well, I'll give you four new engines, but you got to move it where I, I can see it. So they said, yes, sir, and away it went. I got a ride in this. You'll see that later. Out at Reading, I mentioned the uh, reenactor situation. There, there's all different kinds. There's American, Japanese, German, British, Canadian. They may not all be from those countries, but they're certainly reenacting. Isn't that a tiger? Yeah. This uh, tiger tank is, I don't know as it really is one. I think it's kind of made up to be very close to it. Uh, I think it was in a couple of movies. This thing shows up from time to time and then goes away and then something else shows up. I mentioned about the, the hangar dances on Friday and Saturday nights. Big, big band music, Glenn Miller, uh, everything of the, of the time, including people that sing the vocals. And these guys are seated in, in the back of the hangar. And then between them and the, the opening in the hangar is where everybody dances. And there's all kinds of high school kids. And most of the reenactors who are uh, they are, will dress up in their dress uniforms at night. It's, it's quite something to see. And then later uh, at the end, uh, I'll show you a few shots of Normandy. This uh, guy apparently was over there. This is the shot in Reading. Uh, he, was, he was there for the 50th anniversary. I went with a friend of mine. We were there at Omaha Beach for the 70th anniversary. Stu, that's it. That's it for that photo. So that was the introduction. We'll march through uh, different topics here. Okay, Yankee Lady, you've seen this fly. Uh, interesting. This is based in uh, Ypsilanti, uh, Michigan, near Detroit. It was built by Lockheed out at Burbank, California. Uh, July 16th, 1945, so it went right to uh, storage. It eventually flew with the Coast Guard, Air Sea Rescue, uh, was first sold in 1959 to uh, a company for $6,000. Later on in history, the Yankee Air Force, uh, based out in Detroit, paid $250,000 for it in 1986. And it's uh, painted in the markings of a B-17G assigned to uh, 381st Bomb Group. That's the, the triangle with the L. You can't, the L is hidden by the, the right wing there. Eighth Air Force flying out of uh, the RAF Ridgewell Airfield in England, late 44. But of course, this was never in the war. The Yankee Lady name. Uh, does not replicate any known combat veteran B-17. So, a couple of
couple of there's you can see the L on the on the tail there. When they do the air show, they do what they call these a photo pass. Instead of just flying overhead where you look at the, the underneath of it, they, they fly in a, a slow arc and kind of bank one way or the other so you can get to see the top of it. All right, here's a plane, uh, a B-17 also. This is the 909. This is a Collings uh, Foundation plane that was, in, uh, it was at the Morristown Airport several years in a row. They did not come last year. This was built April 45. Again, did not see combat. Uh, let me see. It was a fire bomber for 20 years out in uh, California. Was involved in a crash after it was restored, so they restored it twice. The uh, name 909 is in honor of the 91st Bomb Group, 323rd Squadron, of the same name, which completed 140 missions without an abort or a loss of a crewman. The original 909 that this was named after made 18 trips to Berlin, uh, had 21 engine changes, 15 main gas tank changes, and uh, had 600 patched flak holes. And that was about the story on that one. You can fly that one for 450 bucks. Yeah. Right. I, I flew in that one, $450. Well worth it. You, you get 30, 30 minutes in the air on, on most of these flights. Yes. That does not include the taxiing, so, which is an interesting thing in itself. Here's obviously, anybody here familiar with a B-17, feel free to speak up and explain what's going on, but it's obviously the, the yoke and the engine controls and so forth. The only thing that I want, Curtis LeMay had one of these as a private plane, and the inside where the crew used to be was walled off with gabardine cloth, and he made himself like a, a, a little cubby hole in there with, you know, just gabardine around the inside, so I got a kind of walk through and did some electrical work on it, but, you know, never flew it or anything like that. I huh. never got lucky. But it was Curtis LeMay's. Private plane. Yeah, kind of like, you know, he had the big shot, so he had his own B-17. He had his own B-29, too. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, LeMay started in, in Europe with the B-17s, and then they moved them out to uh, the Pacific, when the Pacific uh, B-29s were not getting the results they wanted. This is an obvious shot looking out the nose of the plane. To get to there, you have to climb underneath the pilot and you have to crawl down on your Yeah, right. I did that. The, the insides of these planes are built for like 110 pound guys who are 5 foot 2 and they're 18 years old. I mean, this is a major struggle for me to, to get around. The thing I like about this plane, the uh, 909, is the, the, the compartment right after the bomb bay is kind of the radio area. And there's a few seats there, but there's also a hole in the roof, so to speak. Yeah. And you can, I'm sticking my head out the, the roof, take these pictures. You can do it when you're flying too, if you dare. Don't wear a hat you'll, or glasses, you lose everything. This is uh, looking towards the front of the plane from the rear. That's the ball turret, the shiny thing, aluminum oh, wow. thing on the bottom. You got the two uh, 50 caliber belt boxes left and right. And I think when you hear the phrase, you know, let's give them the whole nine yards, <laughs> that, that I, I read somewhere, the, the cartridge belts are nine yards long. So it has nothing to do with football, it has to do with running through every single bullet in the belt. Does that sound right? Yep. Here is the radio room, uh, looking forward towards the bomb bay. Uh, I don't know if any of this stuff works, but if you're ever going to fly this thing, no, sorry, this is from the front, looking towards the back, where the, you can see the ball turret and the the, the belt, the belts on the bottom. Uh, that little, let me hold on, Stu. Here, this thing is a little stool you can sit on. 
And I sat on that and you can shoot a video or stills out the windows while you're taking off and landing. So I recommend that. This is in the back of the plane looking towards the front. 50 caliber. This is all very, very tight, very small area. I don't, how they got 10 guys in here is, is a miracle. And then the Bombay situation. You've got this catwalk here, which is relatively narrow. It's like about a two by six in lumber terms, plus or minus. And when, when everybody is seated and belted in when you take off, and shortly after you take off, uh, they say you can walk around, they give you a signal. So I walked from the radio room, which is behind me, up towards where the pilot area is, and you're walking along this catwalk and between you and eternity are the Bombay doors. <laughs> and when, before you get on the plane to take off, the, uh, the guy, they give you a safety briefing, and he very casually says, you know, don't fall off the catwalk because you'll go through the Bombay doors and you'll be dead. And then, then they go on to the next point. You didn't have to sign a disclaimer? Oh yeah, you sign a release, yeah, sign? but yeah. it's basically, you know, pay attention, it's not for kids. Uh, this is in the very rear of the plane. Uh, th th what you see, the cushions are where other people sit. Some people, of course, move around from front to back, others don't. Uh, but uh, if you're going to fly in, in a plane, I would always, Stu, that's the last one. I would always try to get a, a ticket, even if it costs a little more money, to fly behind the pilots up front. You can see him working the controls and look out the front of the plane. Did you did you walk through the catwalk uh, with the Bombay doors open? No. Only when it's on the ground. They don't open it in flight. Oh, in flight they don't open. Okay. <laughs> no, they're not that crazy. Yeah. All right. This is uh, also owned by the Collings Foundation. This is at Marstown. There's there's a this plane has not been to Reading, but there's another one from the Confederate Air Force that shows up at, at uh, Reading from time to time. Uh, this one was built uh, by Ford at Willow Run, Michigan. Flew 130 years. The original witchcraft flew 130 missions and was scrapped in 1945. <coughs> but uh, the Collings Foundation find, found this one, which saw combat in the Pacific Theater under the RAF. Uh, let me see. Guy acquired it in 1981. It was disassembled here and transported back to England in a cargo plane. That's not cheap. And then in 1984 the Collings Foundation purchased it and shipped it back over here by sea and it's been uh, operating for them ever since. You know there's an American Air Museum in Britain Oh yeah, Duxford. Yeah, yeah. I've been. I highly recommend if you go to England, go to Duxford and see. This is in the B twenty four. That you know, one of these shows up at Reading from time to time. This is in the rear, looking as far as I could get to the rear of the plane. I'm just too big and fat and old to, to crawl through all this stuff. Uh, these are shot out of up on the B twenty four. They have uh, the, the waste gutter windows don't exist. It's just an opening in the fuselage, so you can lean out and take pictures. And this is flying around somewhere around Lake Pacon area, more or less. Uh, this could be, I don't know, Route 10, who knows, Route 46 way out there. So it, a totally different uh, sound feel. When I was, was riding it, I, I sat right behind the pilots, which you can do, and I, again I recommend. And after they took off, I wanted to go up to the front to see what that was like. And as you're crawling on your belly from behind the pilots up to where the front <coughs> turret is, the, 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 the sorry, uh, hold on a second. This, uh, the, the pony wheel up front, the little lead wheel, this thing is still spinning like crazy from the takeoff and it's within like a foot of your head. <laughs> and there's also, of course, the doors that cover up the wheel are right there, and just like in the, in the B-17, if you step on the catwalk, off the catwalk, you're, you're out into your eternity. Okay, next. What's the 130? Is that, is that you're controlling? 
No, I'm done. Oh, that's the end. Oh, one, one, one thirty on it. Uh, for 130 missions, 130 I think. 130 missions, okay. Yeah. Uh, okay, now we're into the B-29 area era here. I, I threw in a couple pictures. There's a B-29 outside of Hartford, Connecticut at the airport. There's a World War II museum up there. Now this is the nose art on this one. I forget the name of it. But this is an immaculate restoration. It's, it's in its own hangar, own building, so to speak. There's a, a number of displays around it. Uh, engines you can take a look at up close. I don't have a picture of it that was any good. But remember in the B-29s, the, all of the gun turrets were kind of linked by computer. One guy would aim one and the other ones would all follow to hit a target. They have the computer, quote unquote, which was all mechanical. It's, it's a, you got a plexiglass front on it so you can see the guts, but it, it's like 5,000 Swiss watches. There's gears and levers and poles and all kinds of springs and everything else. All uh, so to synchronize uh, the turrets all looking at one target. On the left in the foreground is uh, the, uh, the turret from the top of the plane. It's very worthwhile. This is a very good museum. If you're ever up there in Hartford, it's well worth uh, four hours at least. <clears throat> okay, this is out at Reading. That's me as an imposter, uh, World War II imposter. I flew the plane, I forget what years, a bunch of years ago. Uh, the fellow on the left, I forget his name at the moment, but uh, he's one of their standard pilots. And the fellow up front, he paid like $1,500 to sit in the bombardier's seat. It's, it's too bad he didn't have on a, you know, a World War II shirt and a World War II hat. It would, it would look better in the pictures. This is basically from my position. This seat goes for about $1,000. And you, you sit, the seat that I'm in is right behind the pilot on the left. The kid on the right, 40 something, I don't know, he's uh, kind of in training. The UB 29 guys, it was very interesting when they were flying this, the co pilot did most of the flying and he was constantly taking the, the, the wheel and going hard lock left, hard lock right. It wasn't just kind of a fingertip, you know, fly along. He was constantly going all the way. I don't know if that's typical or there was a problem or the wind was a problem that day. Struck me as odd. This is the flight engineer's position. This is the position my father had for a while. Uh, this fellow here controls the engines, everything to do with them. And I didn't know this, but when you take off, whatever, he handles the throttles to take off even though he can't see where they're going. The pilot, let me go back. Off to his left arm, you can't see it, but there are throttles there also, but he never touched them. The flight engineer took care of everything. So that's different. I mean, if you go in a 747, the early ones, the flight engineer didn't fiddle with the throttles as far as I know. It was the pilot and the co-pilot. But here it was a different arrangement. So here we are flying over uh, Bucks County, Pennsylvania. $1,500 man with his golf cap on. <laughs> Shot out the window to prove I was there. This picture was taken by, there was a husband and wife uh, a team couple. Uh, they came up from New Zealand to fly on this thing. So I gave him my camera. Another shot of the pilot. Co-pilot, baseball cap guy with his phone. <laughs> flight flight engineer talking to my father after the flight. And there's my mother who's sitting next to me and my father. Yeah. Airplane in flight. I think this is last year. So this year you'll see you'll see this one will be giving rides and will be 
not accessible for tours. Doc, the other one that you saw in the video, the shiny one just restored, will be there this year and it will give tours. So I really urge people to go out and crawl through the B-29 on a tour. If it takes you an hour in line and costs $20, so what? You know, it may never show up again. You never know. Is this difference between the shine and the non-shine to the oxide on the aluminum? No, 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 no. This one was painted okay. by Boeing years ago. Uh, I, I don't know why, but they did it. Uh, Probably corrosion. Pr corrosion protection, I would think. Yeah. The R's are painted. The uh, dock is just as built, shiny, <coughs> polished aluminum. I like the aluminum flavor better. Here we are coming in for a landing. The, the give, giveaway that this is Redding is the pagoda up here. So this plane is, uh, it, you know, some years they all take off one direction, the next year they may all take off other directions or flip directions during the day, of course based on the direction of the wind. So depending on which way they come in and out, you get good pictures or bad pictures. Anybody know who this is? This is Dutch Van Kirk, the navigator on the Enola Gay. He was out there a couple of years. Uh, talking, he gave a talk, he signed autographs, and here he is holding a picture of uh, number 82, the Enola Gay. It was, it was funny, one of the years I was there with my father, we, we happened to be staying in the same hotel, could have been the year at Ford for three days. Went down for, for breakfast and there's, he was there, Paul Tibbetts was there, a couple other people, and they started talking about the B-29s and it went on for an hour, you know, like this engine, that problem, this lever, this wire, that cable. And, he, you know, my father didn't tell me all this stuff, but as soon as you get somebody that knows what's going on, they open up. Stu, it's all yours. for a second and, and kind of show you what the rest what else is there now a lot most of these are taken on a Friday without 20,000 of my closest friends all over the place so this is a German uh, Kugelwagen the pronunciation is bad but it's kind of like the, the original version of the VW thing here's uh, I don't know what the how to, I mean it's a half track but I don't know the exact model there, there's areas on, on this, one of the handouts I gave you, there's areas, you know, for Germans, areas for the South Pacific Americans, areas for the Japanese. Uh, this, this is at the vehicle uh, show, so here's a bicycle, vintage bicycle. Local girl dressed up in proper clothes. Another vintage bicycle with a basket. There's a motorcycle in there someplace. <laughs> Fighting CBs. Here's one of our half tracks. I, until Reading, I had never seen one of these things in person run along, and they, they really can go quite fast. The other year, here's another one. The other year, they had a Sherman tank, which I had never seen run, and I don't have a picture of it because I think I'm shooting video. But uh, they move along very, very quickly. People bring this stuff in from all over. In fact, this Reading World War II weekend is considered one of the premier World War II weekends in the country. And there's people that show up here from all over the place. California, Florida, even New Jersey. Don't they have a parade of vehicles? Yes. Friday, they uh, every all the vehicles get in, for, uh, in a line and they go down to Reading and they sort of terrorize the town. It takes a couple hours. Here's a nice uh, Packard, a gentleman just told me on the right here, my right. That's Douglas MacArthur, reenactor. He's here most years. Here we have a motorcycle with sidecar. I had a ride in one of those in England. 
Yeah, uh, through a rainstorm. Oh. I was in the sidecar. Oh, it must have been funny. Uh, you, you got wet. Yeah. That's true. That's true. This, as far as I know, is, is the real thing. So if you're into vehicles, there's there's all kinds of stuff to see. It's, it's not just planes. They have a filling station. Yeah, there's a recreated filling station in Gulf. There's little uh, dioramas and displays all over the place. <coughs> MG Triumph, something the British, something or other. Triumph. Triumph. Oh, uh, MG. 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 It's a British soldier. Stu next. Okay, I am. I have to apologize profusely. I don't. Have, maybe you can read some of the name tags. But these are some of the veterans that are here that give talk. Whoops. It didn't hit pause. No, I know. Yeah, maybe it You're fired. <laughs> pause. Pause. There we go. All right. I'm really sorry. I didn't. I have notes, but I couldn't find them for this thing. But these are guys that did something spectacular, and they just like look like little old guys walking around, but when they're on stage and they go over what they do, it's pretty amazing. Looks like they're having fun. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. They, uh, they they pay for these folks to show up. On stage, I forget which one is one. I think it's the second from the right with the beer or Coke can, whatever it is there. Um, one of them is, I think, is uh, Bill Gar Garnier. Was one of the Band of Brothers uh, people. Uh, I mean, that was where the, the movie was made of, from the Band of Brothers people. They've had uh, a guy here that was in Auschwitz and Mauthausen. He survived it. He gave it a, a pretty stunning talk. A couple of guys from D-Day, B-17 crewman, B-26. Nathan Klein was a B-26 crewman from Normandy. Uh, forget who the guy on the right is. And our own Bob Voucher was there. I even got his autograph before I knew who he was. Voshe. Voshe? Voshe. Sorry. He flew it on feet feet one year. Yeah. There's a B-24 Ploesti Raid guy here. A couple of people from the 509th uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki trips. I was in that group. Not there. No, at peace. Bob Organ from the Mem the real Memphis Bell was here one year. <coughs> They've had some Medal of Honor winners. One guy from I Iwo Jima, Tuskegee Airmen. It's it's very I, I, a couple of years I, when I went, I just went to hear the, the veterans talk. And you'll see on one of my handouts, they kind of say who's going to talk at what time, and some of these things change depending on who's available or who's sick. But uh, it's it's well worth it. This was, uh, that gun was obtained from the German guy whose picture was framed by the guy in yellow who I can't remember. So this is all embarrassing, but at any rate, uh, these two guys, I forget who is who. I think the German guy is on the right and the American guy is on the left. They were in some kind of dogfight situation over Germany and they were shooting at each other. And 50 years later, here they are explaining how they did all that to each other, and they missed, so here they are. <laughs> a very interesting conversations. On the right is uh, uh, Ermi from the, uh, what do you call it, mail call show on the History Channel. He was there a couple of years, I haven't seen him recently. Here's a couple of the Band of Brothers guys again. When they're on stage talking about, you know, Normandy and Omaha Beach and scaling uh, Point to Hawk and all, it's, it's very, uh, very moving and informative. And once they get off the stage, that is blend in with everybody else. I have no idea who they are. A couple more of the fellows. Inside the main hangar, other fellows that don't talk, sign autographs and so forth and so on. So there's fewer and fewer. Okay, Stu. Oops. I'll forget 
että se on. All right, these are other planes, various years. If I'm not an expert on the little planes, I'll call these little planes. This is this a P-51? Yeah. Okay. These sound great. I mean, as you all know, they're nothing like a Mustang and nothing like a B-25. It's just uh, remarkable stuff. No, yeah, but that's a British animal. Correct. The Merlin, yeah. Yeah, the Merlin, yeah. Built, and some of them made here under license. They have Navy stuff, too. Is that the one where the wings folded up? Last no. year they had one that really No, this one, the wings don't fold on this one, but you can ride in the back and have the thrill of your life. These are a bunch of trainers, I think. Is that right? 86. 86. Okay. There's normally a number of these. Anybody chip in if you want to. I'll just keep moving along. That's the Navy version. That's the SNJ. Okay, T Navy T version of SNJ, the man says. T6. T6. That's a, a Japanese plane. This is a, a, a recreation, fake fraud, uh, not too bad replica of a uh, Pearl Harbor type uh, <coughs> torpedo bomber. There is a zero, right? No. Replica. No. 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 Zero. Too fat. Too fat. <laughs> and plus it has uh, fixed landing gear. Okay. Out of <coughs> Sorry. Okay. What's this one? Two forty seven. Two forty seven. All right. Hold on a second. DC-3 also. DC-3 right. Yeah, I've got a, sh I've got a sheet on this one, like Goonie Bird or somewhere. It's interesting when you, remember I was telling you about the synchronization of the props by sound feeding? Yeah. When he's been taking these pictures, a lot of them have the props in the same position. Only yeah. because with the camera, you know, yeah. it catches them in the same position. Yeah. This is a C-47, you said? Yes. Yeah. All right. Anybody read the name? This it doesn't matter, in a way. There were, there's going to be two, uh, two of them there coming up. Uh, one of them was a C-47D, uh, owned by the National Warplane Museum in Geneseo, New York. And that one, not, it's, it's the one that painted olive drab with the D-Day stripes on it, went back to Normandy, and it was there for the, 20, the 70th anniversary of D-Day. We'll see that coming up, I think. Uh, this one, is this a C-47 Skytrain? Yep. Okay. There's one of the... 12,000 were made in World War II. Wow. Well, the, the airlines used them, too. Yeah, they yeah. used them after the war. C-3s, after the war, the Brits called the code. The same Germany with Berlin with the airlift. That's right. Well, that was C-54s. Yeah, this is interesting. Uh, the, uh, this, this particular plane, uh, not this one, but the C-47 type, we called it a Skytrain and the RAF called it a Dakota. Mm -hmm. And somebody thought, uh, wrote here on the internet where everything is true, it <laughs> says uh, Dakota could stand for Douglas Aircraft Company Transport Aircraft. If you take a couple of letters from each word, you come up with Dakota. Yeah, also called the Goonie Bird, of course. And uh, this, one of these, the one that painted the other, the other style, they, they says they dropped 50,000 paratroopers during the first few days of Normandy. These things flew uh, Bastogne, the Hump, Berlin Airlift, and so forth. Uh, Some say the DC-3 is one of the three best designed planes yeah. ever. Yeah. They're still flying. Yeah. They just don't fly fast. Yeah, but they stay in the air. Yes, they yeah. do. Yes, they do. They get there. I've been in this one several times, but you know, in rough weather. <coughs> you wouldn't believe it. That's right. <laughs> this plane Panchito. This plane Panchito. I have a, a write-up on this if I can find it quickly. I'm not doing too well on this writing. Here we go. B-25, uh, the original Panchito, this is not the original, 
flew in uh, the Central Pacific 1943 to 44. Where the name come from, it says again on the internet, was the feisty Mexican rooster from the 1943 animated musical, The Three Caballeros. So the present day plane, which you're looking at, was delivered in February 45. April 45 went to Texas for storage. Then it went to Westchester, New York, South Carolina, and around and around and around. Uh, eventually was uh, used to fight forest fires. Went to uh, Florida to a museum that closed. And then another guy bought it and rebuilt it back to the original J model look. And after spraying for fires and crops, you know, everything was all butchered up. And uh, it's currently owned. Where is it owned? I forget. At any rate, it's very interesting talking about how, how they said the worst part of, fly, of flying this thing was getting to the end of the runway. It says this pilot wheel does not steer. And you're constantly fighting with the throttles to, and the brakes to make it go left, make it go right. And if you do things in the, in the wrong way, the brakes will seize up and then so forth and so on. So it's the worst part of the training is, is learning how to taxi. Here the thing is in the air. This thing is a beautiful machine. It's a polished aluminum. Bombay doors open here. Sounds like like hell, but I mean like really loud. Fake, fake smoke for the for the fans. This is another one. There's several B25s that show up. Okay, here's the Goonie Bird thing again, right? Another B25 on a photo pass. I was on top of it. No, that's not tunneling. No, I was not. Yeah. So it's nice when they, they do it that you can see the top of the plane rather than just the stomach. Mm -hmm. And again, you can see that the props are synchronized. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Could you explain that? Why, why do they? I mean, that's. Well, if they're, out, if, if they're out of rotation, of the RPMs are different. different. They'll, you'll, hear, you'll, you'll, hear, you'll hear in the cockpit, womp, 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 womp. Yeah. And okay. then when you get them tuned, then the won't won't go away. The but tune doesn't mean the props are in exactly the same angle. No, no, no. It's the same <laughs> speed, the same RPM. Same RPM. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah, so these are the same <coughs> RPM, and generally, generally, uh, they're in the same position because it's the interference of the air. Okay. You know, the where the propeller whacks the air. And okay. That's what the pilot hears. All right. So there's there's various demonstrations in the middle of flying the, the air you know the World War II planes there's acrobatic demonstrations and they once they get if they get a bunch of things up in the air a bunch anything from two to ten they got to recover them and land them and then put the next stuff in the air so there's some acrobatic shows of one one person at a time this is a very interesting one the uh, spirit of say, this is spirit of freedom plane is a C fifty four E Skymaster right. Does that sound good? Yep. Owned by the Berlin Aircraft Historical Foundation, which I do believe is based in New Jersey. Jim, is that a DC-4? That's a C-54. DC-4. DC-4. Is that part of the Berlin Airlift? We have one over here that's all polished up in the DC-54. This is the, the, the C-47 and these did most of the work for the Berlin Airlift, right? Yep. Okay. So this thing was delivered by Douglas in March of 45. In April 78, she went to Canada to work for, I guess, a, a, a cargo company named the Sky Trader. It was used to ferry auto parts between Toronto and Detroit for 12 years. So that would be until 1990. The Berlin Airlift Historical Foundation bought this thing in 1998 and restored it and took it on a 70-day European tour to mark the 50th anniversary of the Berlin Airlift. This thing uh, inside, there's kind of a museum of the Berlin Airlift, uh, some displays and pictures, it's very nice to see. Here's that uh, imitation uh, Pearl Harbor plane. 
Now you'll notice the lack of people on the runways, okay? You'll notice the lack of people standing around the plane. You'll notice that the sun is low. This is probably taken 7 o'clock at night after pretty much everybody has left. 6 o'clock, you know, people are eating in their tents or they're eating the, the dinner that you can buy online. Uh, so it's it's very good time to walk around, talk to people, take pictures without people. Here is kind of during during the day the trainers lined up. Uh, now what's this? B forty seven. B forty seven. No, no, B forty forty forty. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Curtis uh, Kitty Hawk, War Hawk, different that, names. That had an American engine in it. An American made engine in it. Okay. Not as good as the Merlin. The Flying Tigers used that plane with General Chennault. Yes. Uh, yeah, I remember the look. I've seen, yeah, I, I'm not an expert <coughs> on instant recall on this stuff, but... Uh, our is going to give us a talk on the uh, Flying Tigers. Yes, really? Uh, that would be, be great. So there's, there's a P-40. I remember making Paul's a model of that when I was a kid. <laughs> yes. Yeah. If you need a couple of parts, <coughs> turbocharger, supercharger, crankshaft, whatever, piston rod, Stuff for sale. I don't know what these are, but they're kind of old and there's a lot of them. Probably a steerman. steerman. Yes, there are a bunch of steermans there. I think this is the inside of the Berlin airlift plane. The P47, or no, 54. 54. 54. Yes, oh, yeah, there. this is the inside of it. Oh, that's great. That 54 that's might have started out as a, as a, a civilian model. It's got, it's got round windows. You did the military. See the radio on the right? Uh, that radio? Yeah. That radio? Yeah. Now, British. this is a Lancaster. Yeah. It's got four Merlin engines, so it's like four P-51s flying at once. This came down from Canada. I believe there's only two flying in the world, the one in Canada and the one in England that they use for their commemorative uh, events. So you, you'll see when the Queen is, has a birthday or a jubilee or something, this and uh, a couple of other planes, a P-51 and a Spitfire, I think, fly down the mall in, in England towards Buckingham Palace. Tom, you're doing a great job. This is fantastic. Yeah, you like this, huh? Well, that's great. That airplane will fly f farther and faster and carry more than a 17. Is that right? Yeah. And the B-24 will do more than a 17. Yeah. You notice how the old airplanes have got the tail running on the ground, where the later ones in the, in the middle of the war, they, then they were a uh, tripod, so the tail was off the ground. Tricycle. Yeah. Tricycle. 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 So that's an early design it's a tail because the tail's on the ground. Yeah. They were still making that in 1950. <coughs> you needed a three-point landing, yeah. which the tricycle did not need. This is the P-51 back at Morristown again. I did not fly in this. That, I think this is two thousand dollars for half an hour, three thousand. That's the B model with the, with the, with the, with the full. Uh, right. Uh, Right, this, this is the trainer version. It's got identical controls front and back, I read. And there were like less than 10 of these made, something like that. Betty, is that named after you? Betty Jane. <laughs> no, oh, yeah. My middle name is Margaret, so I can't. All right, close enough. I really urge you to go to, uh, to Marstown if they're in town. I don't know how to find out about it except to read the local paper. You can go to the Collings Foundation website. Uh, it's just like collingsfoundation.org, something like that. And they have the schedule in there. And when they come to town, Marstown, you can pay, pay spend ten dollars, and you can crawl through these things for three days for ten dollars. And if you want to ride in them, then you pay your four hundred and up. It's a good show. I've been to that show. Yeah. It's excellent. You can park right there. You yes. can you yeah. can just. Yeah. It's amazing. Right, you're back. They have one. They have a show at Tinnabar also. I have not been to in years. Yeah, they they they, fought, they vary where they go, but Morristown is a nice venue. The, the, the problem with Morristown for these guys, and I've talked to the Collings people on the ground, and I say your advertising is is 
not too good. You know, the, the newspapers will only put in photographs, World War II planes show up. They do it the day after they leave. You know, they don't say, hi, they're coming tomorrow, because I guess that's advertising. So they got to do something better. But the, the word gets out, and, and most of the plane, the, most of the, the rides are booked. Uh, Morristown has got people with money within 30, 30 miles, you know, so they sell out. There's one guy showed up, he, he just looked like a normal like auto mechanic or something, and here's my credit card, $3,000, and away he went in the P-51 for an hour. So this is, we're back at Reading here. I was behind him in line. He said, is it okay if I spend this whole hour if I like it? It's like $3,500. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> I feel bad with my So there's three enactors uh, that dress up as, uh, this, is, this is a Navy pilot, right? Yep. Okay. Sort of like George Bush, right? Why is he wearing gloves? <laughs> was this cold up there? Here's the Yankee lady again. Here are Jim's yet. Gentleman Jim. Eddie, you get one, I get one. <laughs> the guy on the wing owns the plane. He's not just a regular tourist. So he's allowed to do that. Hey, we'll let him up there. Right. That, must, that must be Jim. Yeah, we keep him the hell off. Last year, the year before, they had a mosquito plane there. I, I couldn't find the pictures, but that's the one that's made out of plywood by the Brits. They had a metal shortage. And that, I, I went up and kind of illegally tapped on it with a finger, and it's wood. Um, but it goes like hell. It's just it's amazing. Way overpowered for the weight. It just roars right along. Isn't that a fuck off? Yes. Oh, you remember the spruce goose? Yes. Oh, no, it's a stuka. That's a, that's a stuka. This is a, a, a two-thirds or three-quarters scale stuka re yes. replica. That engine's upside down. The inverted engine, I think. Yes. The exhaust is. Yeah, look at the little baby bomb under there. <laughs> and they had, of course, they had the siren to scare the hell out of you. Again, this is late in the day when everybody's uh, relaxing and going home. It's a good time to wander around. Uh, I don't know. B-25, maybe B-25 B out, uh, outfit. Or B-17. Okay, Stu, next. Okay. So we are only aircraft engines right-handed turning. As far as I know, when you're sitting in the cockpit, they all are counter. Or they're all called clockwise. Doesn't matter what side. I think so. Okay. Would that work in the southern hemisphere? I'm thinking. <laughs> yes, yes, Jim, that would work in the southern hemisphere. This is a this is a this is a little. Okay, thank you, This is a little folder. Uh, I call the Signal Corps. I'm kind of my hobby, main hobby, is photography and. There's a bunch of uh, different, uh, people have different displays. The one right in the middle is an aerial camera. You hang it out, you can get in the slipstream and the wind and not rip the bellows off. Because in the old days, the camera on the far left has got a bellows on it. It's a, like a speed graphic type thing. If you stuck that out in a 200 mile an hour windstorm, the whole front would be torn off. So, and plus the aerial camera in the middle has got roll film and you can, can advance it and, sh and trip the shutter with gloves on. The one on the left is more of a ground camera and the one on the left is like the guy that shot the Iwo Jima flag raising, very similar sort of camera. A couple of early 35 scattered around. There's uh, some people that show up one year and not the next. Uh, one guy had a bunch of radio equipment. And, and they just sit there in their chair, their folding chair under a tent. But if you go in, they'll talk to you for four hours about everything. So don't hesitate if you go to, to ask questions. All right, on the right is a speed or a crown graphic with the three battery uh, flash gun, the number 22 or so flash bulb, which are the size of 100 watt light bulbs. Uh, the camera, second from the right, is a 16 millimeter movie camera. Probably could be a K100. I'm not. 
I don't remember, but uh, had a very long spring wind on it. You can shoot a lot of time with a long spring wind. Nowadays, it's all batteries. You can go for hours. The, uh, the next one from the right, third from the right, is kind of an amateur 16 millimeter magazine camera. Um, like three minutes worth of film and then another 16 on the left. Could be a, a gun camera, a cockpit camera on the left, not, not quite sure. Typical uh, camera case of the, of the era. Had a hard fiber case, speed graphic. Uh, up here are film holders, heavy, awkward. Uh, one piece of sheet film on each side, four by five inch. You'd shoot two pictures. Here's extra film. Here's the flash gun head, probably a light meter. Here's one of the re uh, reenactors holding a K100 uh, 16 millimeter movie camera. Here's what a lot Argus of people. C3. Argus, Argus C3. C3. Yes. People kind of affectionately call this the brick. Yes. It was the, the dimensions of, but not the weight of, almost, though, uh, a brick. 35 millimeter, kind of primitive. Uh, you know, you wind the film, film counter, shutter release, focus, range finder focus here and there. And uh, a fixed focal length lens, no zoom. Uh, my father had one of these. I guess I took a couple pictures of one. This is a 16 millimeter movie camera. There's three different lenses. You got telephoto, uh, maybe po probably another telephoto. This could be normal. I don't think it's a wide angle. Skate key uh, wind up thing. Every time you shoot, you got to wind and wind and wind and wind and wind. Because 16 millimeter film, I forget which is the feed, but the take up, it's either top or bottom. Film goes through these things really fast and you just got to keep winding and winding them. This is the sort of camera that they shot most of the, the battle footage, World War II, Titanic crash, all that. Okay, Stu, next. We don't have a whole lot more here to go. If you're bored, you can leave. We're oh, not bored. No. <laughs> all right. That's great. I must take a leave. Thank you, Todd. Thank okay. You. Good to see you all. Best of luck to you. Come back. Actually, my uncle was a combat photographer in France. Oh, cool. World War II. I'd like to talk to you. With the Filmos. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll give you my... Okay. Give a talk. Give a talk. I've got... Yeah. Actually, I've got photos of them, too, so... All right. Send, send me an email, Todd. Thank yes. You thank you. Thank you. Thanks again. Township of Chatham. Very good. Dick. Cool. Good one. Thank again, you if you much. can. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. This is uh, more reenactors. This would be yep. the civilian ones, right, Stu? Yeah, it looks like fantastic. So at any rate, uh, I kept talking about the local kids uh, get dressed up in period clothes. Here, this when you first come in one of the gates, there is a, a, a recreation of a French village that the volunteers made. There's there's a uh, a bar, so to speak, a cafe, a Napoleon cafe. You can see the picture of Napoleon on the wall up here. Napoleon. Mm -hmm. This guy works for the Strasbourg Railroad. He's a machinist and another folks. Oh, we've been on that. Yeah. Uh, so a, a lot of reenactors show up here and uh, and these are just uh, shots, real Coca-Cola bottles. Mm -hmm. If you look at the bottom of them, they'll tell you where the bottle was made. Really? Yes. Okay. Well, that used to be fun in an air base because they used to have Coke bottles from all over the world. Yes. And you'd go get your coke, and the guy that had the farthest away had to pay. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> the old ball had, a, had, a, had a location on him. I thought the farthest guy away might get some ice cream or a beer or something. Well, they, you could change the rules. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatever you want. Whatever. So uh, these are just walking around, uh, grab somebody and say, hi, can I take your picture? This thing was being staged for a, a professional photographer, and I just kind of muscled in. There's a bulldozer in there someplace. Uh, this is another CB kind of picture. Behind old Dave. These guys, Abbott and Costello, and Jimmy, the reporter on the left. The fellow in the, in the middle is 
Abbott, right? Yes. Okay. No, Costello. No, Costello. 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 Uh, Costello. I always, I always got it mixed up. He passed away recently, and last year was his first year not there. <laughs> so they were always fun. And it, if you ever take the Liberty ship crews out of Baltimore, they used to be on there doing a bunch of the old routines, and they would do the routines and the hangar dance as well. The guy on the left, the straight man, was actually paid more, 60%. The comedian, 40 Really? For some reason. Yeah. Huh. Costello well, was from Patterson. Yeah, Patterson. Yeah. One, one T, Patterson. The guy I worked with, who I went to school with. So uh, there's a, an FDR reenactor here. He gives a speech. I forget whether it's Friday or Saturday night, but he, he does the uh, FDR speech, yeah. standing up and um, you know the dastardly attack and all that stuff. So that's interesting. Here's uh, R. L. E. Ermy again with a yeah. German reenactor kind of woman with a German shepherd. Every now and then there's a wedding that takes place. Uh, bride and groom in the middle, of course. Yeah, but he's a marine. <laughs> yes. This is a, a Russian peasant woman reenactor. No shoes? Correct. No shoes. This is at the hangar dance. I shot a bunch of videos, so no stills, but this is representative people that show up. Hobby stockers. Yeah. yeah. They all have on this red lipstick. Here's another uh, wedding. It's coming back. <laughs> the guy on the left was quite the dancer. Uh, is that a zoot suit? Zoot suit. No, I don't oh. think so. All right. Stu next. Was he a gangster? Uh, I don't know. You don't feel that way. Yes. <laughs> All right. We got this one and then two more. Still, you're doing well. Pause, pause. Press pause. I'll be fine. All right. Now, this is interesting. The uh, I think this is China. Yeah. China. And this is not, this the main, this is uh, the Formosa China. Or this is the, uh, what's the guy's name that was in China? Shanghai. Yes, Shanghai. yes. Shanghai. these are the Shanghai Shek people, not, not the communist people. At any rate, one year there were like two. And last year there's like 30. So you never know what you're going to see. They have mock skirmishes. Yeah, there's mock skirmishes. There, at, the, at the French village, there's a skirmish between the Germans and the Americans. and. I never really knew how loud some of these guns are, like a rifle. They're really loud, uh, even with, of course, with blanks. <laughs> so there's Air Corps reenactors. This is the D-Day uh, airborne reenactor. The guy on the right was a little bit like the Walter Matthau, doesn't he? Yeah, it does. <laughs> guy on the left looks like the uh, Back to the Future kid. <laughs> Michael J. Fox. Michael J. Fox. Here's the Hazard, Hazard group Hazard. again. This is, I believe, an actual veteran of airborne veteran. I think that's his name on the Jeep there, Lieutenant James. And they gave a, a discussion. The fellow with his arms out is doing the talk, uh, talking. This guy is, as he talks, he's explaining the different stuff that he's wearing and on and on and on. I remember one of the big problems with D-Day uh, with the parachute people was, and they're not made up for it here, but we had a, a harness that attached to the chute, of course, and it was like, I'll exaggerate, like six or eight buckles and clips and all that to get out of this thing might take you a minute or two. And if you parachute it into water or a swamp, you basically drowned because you couldn't get out of this thing. You know, the, the weight of everything you were wearing, the pack and the guns, would, would take you to the bottom. The British had a, a single release thing. You, you, you whacked it with your fist and the whole thing flew apart. 
So that if, if you got stuck in water, you just pounded that one thing and get out. So very instructive. Happy people. Here's MacArthur again. <laughs> MacArthur with civilian people. If you want these kind of pictures, you just got to say, hi, do you mind if I take your picture? 98.99% of people would stop and do whatever. This is MacArthur holding a picture of himself 60 years ago <laughs> with his Packard, with the, the, the uh, blackout lights. Yeah, I, I think that's a, that's a, a post-war Packard. Okay. I agree, John. Yeah. When MacArthur was a cadet at West Point. 48. This is uh, German people with the Panzerfaust. This is uh, gearing up for all, all these vehicles that are in line for the Friday parade to go terrorize downtown Reading. <laughs> the German woman again with her shepherd. Yum yum dining hall, no <laughs> this, this, These guys are sort of dressed up as the South Pacific, I believe. Here's one of our guys with a bazooka, at my request, aiming at the German tank. Uh, German half track. So, yes, German half track with airborne people. Here's your custom made dinner. Back to this again. This is a Russian reenactor. Anybody tell me what all this is about? <laughs> this is an actual working flamethrower. During the weekend, you'll see in the schedule that I passed out, uh, they actually do a flamethrower demonstration. So uh, it's a pretty smoky, fiery affair. These are some uh, British or Canadian Australian actors. And towards the end of the day, they're winding down. And one. This was a wild group. Um, North African British reenactment. And they have all the proper silverware and crystal and everything else. Here they are dressed up. They've been here several years, not last year. The German guys really get into this stuff. <laughs> and there's not always water or coffee in these tip containers. This is the British, I believe, or Canadian. German contingent. Back to the hangar dance, Marine on the right. Another North African German sort of guy. Guess who that is? Wrong.
Pause. You see all kinds of shirts. Yeah, this was last year. <laughs> so this would be Scotland with the flag. Flag out light. Why aren't there tents flat? Huh? Why aren't there tents flat? <laughs> Don't know. Too expensive. The British. Now, this is. I'm sure you know the history of the, the British flag. The, the red cross part is the Church of England, and the white cross part with the blue background is Scotland. Of course, different color blue. So the, the British Empire flag, Commonwealth flag, is a composite of three flags. The third one is Wales, I think. I forget which. I think they call that St. Andrew's flag. Huh? I think they call that St. Andrew's flag. Could be. <coughs> the composite is the Union Jack, of course. Yes. The Union of the three. Yes. Very. Yeah, that's a Jack is a flag. Does this look familiar to anybody? Oh, yeah. <laughs> First thing they tell you, if you drop your, your plate in the water, don't grab for it. You'll take the skin off your hand. Oh. It's going to about 180 degrees. Oh, yeah. Oh, is that right? Don't have any good stills of the people, but but they're they're like ten or twelve. Now we store with that Polish American. I don't know. <laughs> this what, is the, what the, we need the, the <laughs> famous <laughs> potato <laughs> masher grenade yeah, yeah, from the yeah. Germans. Yeah. Little TNT here, and you can see the. Uh, whoops! What did I do? Hold on! Hold on! Hold on! Sorry, wrong button. This is the uh, battery with the plunger and so forth. A number of people have recreated the uh, the trunk, sort of, that people the people had. Locker. The locker. There you go. And there's all kinds of period stuff. Stu, you told the story, oh, the fellow you went there. The guy there. I went with last year, he thought these are free samples. I said, don't touch anything. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if this is authentic or not, but it uh, looks good. This is the flea market here. No, 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 no. This is the reenactor area. Yeah. This is a s identification silhouettes. I think this is what he saw. It's okay. Yeah. Lucky charms go way back, huh? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Lucky stripes go way back. Insect louse powder, insecticide louse powder. Oh, LSMFT? Yeah. It's toasted, it's a. Like he's like me, find your back. Here is eight different kinds of spam cans, different languages. <laughs> Russian is chow. <laughs> the upper left, upper right, second from the right. That chow means chow. That means chow? Yes. It's, well, it's pronounced chow. I don't know if it's meant. <laughs> what looks like a four is a ch. Okay. All right. Guess what this is. Molotov. Oh, Molotov. You got it. This is a Molotov oh. cocktail. Oh, oh wow. <laughs> Apparently, what they did. Uh, the, this is part of the Russian display. Apparently what they did is, is they, they put the gasoline in here and put a, a cork in it and so for transportation. And then when you got to where you sort of wanted to use it, you take the cork out, put the rag in, light the rag, and throw it. Just to drink a bottle of vodka to make one of these? <laughs> I'm sure that's how they got Every it. Other one. <laughs> Here's uh, the fearless leader. Yeah, he was pretty ruthless. Okay, Stu, next. I think we're... Last one, I think. Last one, yeah. I wanted to wind up with a little... Pause. Okay. 
just just to wind up here, a uh, buddy of mine, we went to France for the 70th anniversary of D-Day. And it took me months, but I stumbled into a farmhouse bed and breakfast type thing. And we stayed there. Lady spoke English. And there were a bunch of other, re not, we're not reenactors, but there were a bunch of reenactors staying there uh, with their vehicles. And we were like four miles from Hunt to Hawk, six or seven miles from Omaha Beach, just by sheer luck. This is dawn, Omaha Beach, June 6, 2014. That's a reenactor. We got there at like six o'clock in the morning because the lady we got, had rented the room from said, as of 6.30, Nobody in this entire province of France is allowed to be on the road because a couple of miles from Omaha Beach, depending on where you are, it could be right now, a couple hundred yards, is the cemetery, and that's where all the politicians were, Obama and you know Sarkozy, and all these people were giving speeches. And Putin was there, so nobody could move anywhere. So we decided, well, we're going to be on Omaha Beach, so we parked. And uh, they had a very small but powerful cemetery at dawn. And they had bands there playing the national anthems of France, Britain, and the United States. A few reenactors. I shot a lot of video here, not some stills. I just, I didn't, I took hundreds of pictures, but I just picked out a few. Had the mayor of the town gave a little speech. Just this normal, simple people that live there. All the politicians and the camera and NBC News is up at the cemetery, but this was a local thing. And they do this every year. Yeah, they have more tradition about World War II than our kids or anybody around here does. This is, yeah, you go to Paris and between the airport and here, you go through Paris and the suburbs where the Taliban bombed this and everybody riots and they're on strike and all this stuff. Once you get within five or ten miles of the beaches, it's like, welcome. And it's, it's very, very nice. You could spend four or five, you could spend a week here, you know, poking around. There's bunkers to see. There's plenty of museums, people to talk to. This was just an impromptu uh, display on the beach. One of the reenactors kind of looking off towards England. <coughs> a little later on. It's very moving to be here. Do they still have any of the uh, bunkers or whatever? The bunkers are all there. You can wander around, go in them, see what things are like. There's plenty of there's museums with equipment. This is the uh, American cemetery. All the flags are on the can of D-Day and the politicians being there. We walked around after everybody had left. This particular cross with the gold leaf signifies a Medal of Honor winner. So we, we walked around and you could see where like 10,000 people, 5,000 must have been there. There were seats and, you know, carpeting and all this stuff. And we got there after it was all over and you were allowed to walk around. So I've, I've been here a couple of times. This, these are all shot in the afternoon, so I'm kind of looking northwest. The blue in the distance is the English Channel. And the Omaha Beach is between where we are and the ocean and the English Channel. And Omaha Beach runs for miles east and west. You look at north there. This is the fellow I went with. He was in the Air Force, Air Force Reserves. That's Theodore Roosevelt Jr.'s grave. Oh, yeah, yeah. Medal of Honor. He landed, I think, on Utah Beach. And what's very, very fascinating is you've got to take a lot of time. You can walk around because there's many, many there's 9,000 guys buried here. And you can, if you look at the grave sites, you know, you'll see a whole bunch June 6th, 
whole bunch June 7th, whole bunch June 8th, then there's another bunch July something, and then August, September, December, as, as all these different battles and events took place, I don't know as they, they put, laid them to rest in, in chronological order, but you'll just notice a consistency with the dates. Didn't he take over as Pete Minister when the original guy got killed? I believe so. He, that's what Something he, like he that. He stepped into the thing. He was, uh, Theodore Roosevelt Jr. was on <laughs> Utah Beach very, very close to the beginning. Yeah. Uh, when everybody else was going ashore, and of course they said, you can't do this, you're too valuable. And he said, you know, the hell with that. And he just went on shore. So uh, you, there's stuff to see at Utah Beach. And every June 6th, they have, there's reenactors, there's festivals, there's, uh, they bring equipment and jeeps and trucks and they have the, the young people dress up as, you know, teenagers from World War II in France. So it's, it's, it's an amazing thing. Uh, I could, I, I could probably should give you a Normandy show at some point if you want. So that's it. Very good. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Good photographer. Yeah. See it on YouTube when the master gets to it. Next month is Art Snyder talking about.